The creation myths of Europe and the Near East have sacrifice, incest, patricide and matricide within them, alongside the stories about the creation of the cosmos and humans. It's an interesting mix of themes, and one I'm going to be talking about in this video as I compare the creation myths of the Indo-Europeans with the creation myths of the Near Eastern cultures. And from this, we can show key overlaps and differences. And so, let us take a journey through European mythology to understand where some of our key motifs and themes have come from. And if this sounds interesting to you, then grab yourself a cup of tea and welcome to Crack and Ford. Let's start by giving a brief history of how Europe became populated based on genealogical studies as at the end of 2022. Now we know Homo sapiens came to Europe about 55,000 years ago and mixed with Neanderthals. And the populations then were migrating around for around 45,000 years. These were known as the hunter-gatherers, at which point the farmers of the Near East migrated into Europe. And around eight and a half thousand years ago, these farmers, who we will call the early European farmers, and who had the culture and beliefs from the Near East, well, they arrived in Greece, and there they paused. And it took them about a thousand years to control the landscape, the hills, mountains and forests of Europe, which were very different to the lands they had come from. But once they had conquered these lands, then they migrated across southern Europe and into central and then northern Europe. We also know that around 8,000 years ago, these agricultural farmers had made it to the Black Sea and the Pontiac Caspian Steppe, and it is this location which 2,000 years later would be where the Proto-Indo-European language would start forming, and migrations would happen from here and into Europe. Now, the early European farmers migrated with their families, allowing diverse interbreeding between culturally similar people uh, who migrated together. But when the Indo-Europeans came along, they were only young men, and they interbred with the women of the early European farmers and the hunter-gatherers. And this admixture is clear when we see a genetic breakdown comparing the DNA of those of European heritage today. Nearly all people of European heritage have a mix of all three of these groups. And these migrations continue to happen, not just between six and 8,000 years ago, but they continued and still continue today in all directions by all people between all cultures in various weightings or various strengths. And the result of this is that the cultural mixing and diversity proven with DNA evidence and archaeological evidence, uh, and so proving this genetic mixing, proves that there would have then also have been some cultural mixing and evolution. And so let me talk over that evidence that has been left to us regarding this. And this allows us to try to understand the origins of the myths within the Indo-European landscape. Now, I've spoken in previous videos about the Nordic families of gods, the Vanir and the Aesir. These two groups of gods were at war during the beginning of the world, which offers a tantalising glimpse of what that motif may well have been about, as by looking at the gods who make up these groups, it seems very clear that the Vanir are gods that are from an agricultural farming background, and the Aesir are more warlike gods associated with the Indo-European pastoral farmers. And this motif may be a remnant of when these two cultures collided, a conflict that was mythologized as war. But these families are not just limited to the Nordic gods. We see in the Vedic religion from India, a precursor to Hinduism, that there were two groups of gods here, the Devas and the Asuras. The Devas were considered benevolent gods, while the Asuras were initially seen as powerful beings that occasionally opposed the Devas. And so seem to align to the Aesir and Venir, as they too engaged in war to maintain or gain power. Now, this is interesting for us because most would expect these stories to be made at the point of conflict. And so when the Indo-Europeans came to Scandinavia or when they arrived in Northwest India. But the fact is that this motif persists on opposite sides of the Indo-European region 
suggesting that this is a legacy from Indo-Europeans forming their core mythology at the steppe. And the fact is that these cultures were formed from some of the earlier migrations of Indo-Europeans from the steppe. And so this story could derive from when the Indo-European culture formed and looked to take over the lands of the early European farmers, who were the early inhabitants of that region. But we do also see other examples of this as well, such as the Hittites, who had sky gods and earth gods, with the sky gods being more Indo-European aligned and the earth gods more agriculturally focused. And there is a similar setup in Zoroastrianism, although we do have to be careful or cognizant of the fact that this religion was created after the polytheistic Iranian and Persian religions and their cultures associated with those. And so it would not necessarily be a direct read on Indo-European culture. And for completeness, we can also mention the Greeks with the Olympians and the Titans, and if you want to ask, understand this aspect of the gods more, then I'd recommend watching my videos on giants. But the conclusion here is that the Indo-Europeans were well known for conflict and being a culture that seemed quite different to the agricultural farmers, which may have helped develop a mythology of such a conflict. And although this is supposition, it is something that DNA and archaeological evidence in the future may support. And I'll also make a video specifically about this in the very near future. But it also reinforces that the two cultures did know about each other and did collide. Although we often see that the losers of conflict supplement their culture with key attributes from the succeeding culture or the successful culture or the winners of war. Um, but this doesn't seem to have happened here, not quite as obviously anyway. Uh, but it could account for some of the strange layers of mythology we see elsewhere in Europe. Another clue of the change in culture are the myths about dragons. And I've made a deep dive video on this separately. But as a synopsis for us here, the dragon was originally the provider of life by providing water to lands. And this mythology evolved when agricultural farming was developed. And this turned the dragon as being in control of water. And so it had to be defeated to provide water to the land and rain to the land to allow rivers to flow. And this helped the development of the Storm God idea, who would then have to defeat the dragon, and the reason why the Storm God became such a significant god in the pantheons of the agricultural farmers, and so the early European farmers. But when the pastoral farmers came along with less dependence on the rain, we see the dragon then turn into the cattle-stealing beast of the Avesta and the mistranslated version of the woman-stealing monster in the Vedas. Uh, and this then transferred into European culture. And so where we see this water-providing dragon, we can point it to as being evidence of remnants of the early European farmers. But when we see myths on the dragons stealing cattle or women, then we see that this is the Indo-European influence on the culture. And in some cultures, we, such as, let's say, Greece, we see both with heroes defeating serpents in water, such as Apollo and Python, as well as heroes rescuing cattle and women, such as within the labours of Heracles. And you will also see similar diversity in the Rig Veda and Vestas with cattle raiding mythology and the defeating of the dragon for rain. The mythology of going to the underworld is very much inspired by agricultural culture to help explain the seasons, why the sun disappears. And so we see many cultures having versions of this myth and we see definite agricultural influence in the mythologies of Inanna and Ishtar from the Near East. But this too is played out in Greek mythology with Persephone going into the underworld. But perhaps the most surprising version for us is the one found in Nordic mythology, which is in the story about Baldur's dream. In this story, Baldur is killed and goes to the underworld and Hel says she would release him if everybody weeps for him. Uh, which is an absolute nod to the praying for rain in agricultural ritual. But in the myth, one person doesn't weep, which is Loki, and so Baldur remains in the underworld. And so we can say that deep within what some people would consider to be very Indo-European mythology, 
uh, the mythology of the Nordic culture, we have a Near Eastern underworld myth. And I'll talk more about that in this video on Balder. And I will make a video on the underworld myths separately as well. Now, horned gods are found across early European cultures and are associated with hunting, fertility and the natural world, often shown as male figures with antlers or as a horned animal such as a stag or a goat. He's spoken about in stories of cycles, uh, stories of life and death with the mysteries of the natural world. And so aligns very much to the understanding of agricultural mythology. Now, while the specific origins of the horn god really aren't clear, those cultures that were heavily reliant on hunting and agriculture developed a rich set of religious beliefs and practices that centred around the natural world and the cycles of the seasons, such as associations with life and growth and death and decay, reflecting a duality that was central to the lives of the early European farmers. And it is this tradition that seems to have inspired the creation of the deity. And we see gods that fit this description uh, would include gods like Cernunnos, uh, a Celtic god, but also Pan, the Greek god. But you'd also associate Germanic uh, Ingre or Nordic Freya here too, due to their fertility aspect. The Earth Mother is without doubt the clearest example of an agricultural deity and is something seen sitting alongside the Indo-European Sky Father in later pantheons, showing a clear picture of the merging of these two cultures. Now, whilst the exact origins of the deity are unclear, as we don't know who thought of her first, we certainly see representations of her in the 6th millennium BCE in the Near East, and so before the Proto-Indo-European language came into existence and far from its origins. We have examples of her with the appropriately named Terra Mater from the Roman pantheon, a goddess whose name literally means Earth Mother. But then in similars were Gaia from Greece and Jord, meaning Earth from the Nordic myths, but we also have Mokosh from the Slavic mythology, Prithvi from Hindu mythology, and a Celtic goddess who represents the personification of Ireland, Ariel. And so we have clear examples of her surviving into Indo-European culture. So far, I've highlighted some of the obvious mythological features from agricultural traditions that also appear in the culture of the pastoral-focused Indo-Europeans. But one of the more challenging considerations is about the creation myth. The creation myth of the Near East has a family feud of gods establishing a lineage or a heritage in order to provide a divine background for the ruling deities. And these gods often create the world from a chaos, a sea, and within it a monster who is killed and then split into two, and thus the gods can create the heaven and the earth, and the sea sits within its bounds. But the reconstruction of the creation myth of the Indo-Europeans has Manu and Jimo as twin primordial figures, and Jimo is sacrificed, and his body is used to create the world and people. And this seems somewhat different to the Near East myth. However, this recreation was based on a number of assumptions by the religious historian Bruce Lincoln, a student of Eliade, and it is possible that some of these assumptions were wrong, and clues as to a more Near Eastern flavour of this myth still live within the Indo-European mythology today. Certainly it is a view of Witzel, who wrote a great book on world mythology, that the cutting up of a primordial giant is a very old mythology indeed, one we would probabilistically determine to be Paleolithic in origin. And the suckling of animals by primordial beings found in the Roman and Nordic myth, so with Romulus and Remus and with Emir suckling a Thula, well, that is more likely to be agriculturally influenced. And this is something that Lincoln does agree with. Although many feel that this killing of a giant the killing of Ymir or Yimo is much the same as killing of the monster from the agricultural traditions. 
and so may have been sourced from these people. I mean, we do see the agricultural giant in the form of a cow, considered a pastoral symbol in later versions of the Enuma Elish, which is the Near Eastern version of the creation myth, and this could suggest either Indo-European influence flowing back into the Near East, and this is a possibility as trade was happening between the cultures at this time, especially between the Near Eastern India and the Near Eastern Persia. But it could also have been influenced from Egypt, who were controlling and themselves thus influencing much of the region of the Near East at this time. And they did have a god called Nut, who was often seen in the form of a cow. But we could also ask, why does a cow appear in the Nordic myth to be suckled? Is it there to help the primordial person grow, and so help the sacrifice of Ymir? Um, I think this misses the purpose of the cow in this myth, as it is Althumbla, this cow in the Nordic myth, whose milk provides rivers to the world, and so could be argued that this motif is somewhat like the Garden of Eden in Genesis, which has a number of rivers within it too. Uh, and this therefore could be referencing again some agricultural motif from earlier on. And we also see that there is iconography in Bronze Age Scandinavia that shows man mating with the cow. And so that could open the possibility that Emir and Othumla perhaps created Manu in earlier mythology. And whilst there is speculation here, it does leave us with a situation that is incredibly complicated to figure out, which is also suggesting that Indo-European myths aren't quite as Indo-European as some may believe. And I will make videos about this in the future. But what we understand about the Indo-Europeans is that their mythology involved influence from pastoral farming, and so they moved away from the crop to focus motifs and had much more emphasis on the importance of the cow uh, and then on horses, certainly regarding to ritual and sacrifice, which are key outputs from their mythological belief. And a clear example of this is the dragon mythology, which stopped being about a need for rain and instead became about the need to get their cattle back. But we also must remember that people didn't only migrate at one time and they didn't migrate in just one direction. And there is no such thing as a European being of pure Yamnaya heritage. Indo-Europeans mixed and forced the early European farmers and hunter-gatherers to mix. And this meant cultures, stories and traditions mixed. And this means people like myself have an incredibly tough job unpicking mythologies and motifs and mythemes from one another to find the original myths and their source. But we are working on it, and it is the exploring of these myths, motifs and rituals, which is the mainstay of this channel, and my research. And over time, I will look into these in, in far more detail, as I'm sure there are many questions you have about what I have said. So please feel free to write questions and positive, constructive comments in well below. And so I want to thank my ever supportive patrons. I want to thank all of you for pressing the notification bell if you've watched the video to this point. And if you want to understand some of the myths that were circulating long before farming, then I think the story of the Fair Man of the Dead is a very interesting and very old story indeed, and well worth a watch. Until I speak to you next, please stay safe and well. And this was Crack and Fold.